together from God's Word, and Stephen's going to lead us. Chapter 4 and verses 1 to 22. No sooner had Boaz gone up to the gate and sat down there than the next of kin of whom Boaz had spoken came passing by. So Boaz said, Come over, friend, sit down here. And he went over and sat down. Then Boaz took ten men of the, il- the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. He then said to the next of king, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our kinsman Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me so that I may know. For there is no one prior to you to redeem it. And I come after you. So he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, The day you acquire the field from the hand of Naomi, you are also acquiring Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead man, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance. At this the next of kin said, I cannot redeem it for myself without damaging my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one took off a sandal and gave it to the other. This was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the next of kin said to Boaz, acquire it for yourself, He took off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have acquired from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Mahalon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Mahalon, to be my wife, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance in order that the name of the dead may not be cut off from his kindred and from the gate of his native place. Today you are witnesses. Then all the people who were at the gate, along with the elders, said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you produce children in Ephratha and bestow a name in Bethlehem, and through the children that the Lord will give give you by this young woman, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar born to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore her a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life, and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom 
and became his nurse. The woman of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the descendants of Perez. Perez became the farmer of Hezron, Hezron of Ram, Ram of Aminadab, Aminadab of Nation, Nation of Salmon, Salmon of Boaz, Boaz of Abed, Obed, Obed of Jesse, and Jesse of David. The next reading is taken from St. John's Gospel, chapter 12, and verses 20 to 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it, and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Amen. Thank you, Stephen, for reading for us. So we're finishing up Ruth. We've looked throughout the book and we've seen uh, Ruth's journey from somebody who has basically given up everything in Ruth chapter 1 to be with her mother-in-law uh, and she then has to navigate this new world order uh, with uh, the, her mother-in-law and find some way for them to exist and then Naomi has a really clever idea and says go and talk to Boaz and Boaz will, I wonder actually Will can you turn off number 6 please because it is, I can hear it booming <laughs> Thanks. Um, Bro. So, and then we see, we see Naomi last week goes, has this crazy plan for Ruth to go to Boaz in the middle of the night and say, look, marry me because I, we, we need this redemption. We see that Boaz does, agrees in that point, in that chapter last week, to do what they couldn't do for themselves. And last week we talked a lot about sharing uh, with people what Jesus has done for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. And this week we come to the fulfillment of of that redemption. Um, the, the translation that we used this morning, the New, the new Revised, that's the one that I use, says the, what the, the oh, I forget what it called, what, it, what they called it now, the next of kin or something like that. But actually, it's the, the, the one with the right to redeem or the kinsman redeemer. If you've got um, the, the new international version, it says kinsman redeemer. And it's the next of kin who is the right, who has the right to redeem the family. And so we see here Boaz becoming that redeemer for Ruth and for Naomi. It's a beautiful picture. 
And then we had our John reading for this week. Um, uh, this is the, the gospel reading for Lent week five, because we're in the kind of the, this is the last sort of week of Lent, because next week will be Palm Palm Sunday, and we'll be into Holy Week. And so Jesus says to those that are, are asking, he says, very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. If it dies, it bears much fruit. And we talked about, didn't we, thinking about things in the first week about dying to self. It's a similar idea. And of course, you get this all through Lent is because it's about giving things up. And if you think about Ruth and her situation, she gave it all up. Effectively, she died to the old Ruth to become a new Ruth in this new reality. And, 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 and again, it was the same for Naomi. Bereft, destitute, they had no way back into society. They needed somebody to redeem them. And if you think about our situation now, we think about the pandemic, we think about Lent, we think about the number of things that have gone on that we've lost, where things have had to die, where things aren't the same anymore. We're also confronted with death on a daily basis. We see the numbers of the people who've died as a result of the virus. And in Lent, you give things up with, with the potential that you're going to learn something or maybe uh, come closer to God in it. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But here's the thing. Jesus is saying that if that grain dies, as we know, it has the potential to be a, a tree or a bush or whatever, which produces fruit, which can then produce more fruit. You see, the, pr the principle there is multiplication. When something dies and produces fruit as a result, what ends up happening is you, every seed has the ability to produce a forest. Or every seed has a produce, you know, say an apple seed, has the potential to produce an orchard. Because the potential is there within one seed. And friends, this morning, that same potential for the earth to be fruitful, to be fruitful in terms of spiritual things, we all, as believers in Christ, who have been redeemed in the same way that Naomi and Ruth were redeemed by Boaz, we too have been redeemed by Jesus Christ. And in that same reality, if we die to self, we have the potential to change the world. And now, you might say, well, Ian, I'm not great at doing things. Sometimes, I, you know, I, I miss my words up and I don't, maybe I'm not in the right position to do it and all the rest of it. But God can do that in you, through you, and through for you. But the, the, the thing is, we've got to die first. We've got to die first. If you look at uh, Ruth 4, you see that there are three speeches that are made. And I found these, uh, these, these three speeches really kind of stood out to me. But the one that stood out to me the most was the final speech that the women make. So there's a speech that Boaz makes in verses 9 and 10. Basically, it's a speech act. It's like he's confirming his marriage to Ruth and redeeming the field. Um, and then the elders speak to him, confirming what he said, and they bless him in their speech, and that's in verse uh, 11 and 12. And then the women speak to Naomi, and they bless Naomi. And in this speech, we see here that they bless the Lord, um, who has not left Naomi without a redeemer. Naomi's had a redeemer, and they bless God for that. And then they, they, say, they say, may his name be renowned in Israel. And then they say, he will be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher in old age. And what I want to do this morning is look at those three points and see how they talk to us about what it means to, to basically die and be fruitful. How can we die and be fruitful in that sense? And so we have the first thing there that God has not left Naomi without a redeemer. In the same way that God has not left Naomi without a redeemer, He's not left you and me 
without a redeemer. So in Naomi and Ruth's case, they needed, they were destitute, as we've said, they were poor, they didn't have anything to their name, they had no, they had no credit at all, at, uh, nothing for them. To live off, they needed, a, they needed a man, they needed a redeemer to come and redeem their situation. Boaz was that man. He did for them what they couldn't do for themselves, which is a glorious thing. And in the same way, for me and for you today, God has not left us without a redeemer. God hasn't left us without somebody to redeem us. And what does that mean for us? Well, spiritually speaking, we have no credit before God. Spiritually speaking, we have no way of getting back to God in our own ability. Humanity broke that relationship with God when we sinned, when we fell into sin, which is, sin is basically anything that God doesn't think. So, it's all the stuff that God doesn't think. So, if you have a negative view of yourself, that's not God, that's you, and that's sin. If you, have a, if, you, if, you, if you don't think you can do anything, that's sin, because that's not what God thinks. God says, I've put within you everything you can do. So, sin is anything that's contrary to what God has declared and what God thinks. So, when we decided we were going to think our own way and not the way God, uh, we broke that relationship, and what ended up happening it was we were lost to God, alienated. Paul talks about it like this in um, chapter 2. Um, I might be getting ahead of myself, but I don't care. We're going to go through it. Paul talks about it like this in Ephesians chapter 2. He says this. Ephesians chapter 2. You were dead in your sin and trespass, in which you once lived following the course of this world, following the rule of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived uh, among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of our flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath. I mean, this is some heavy stuff. We were like everybody else, he said. But of course, the Ephesians had come to Christ. They'd come to their Redeemer. And then Paul says, but God rich in mercy out of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ and seated us uh, with Him in heavenly places with Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come He might show the immeasurable, immeasurable riches of His grace towards us in Christ Jesus. Amazing words. You see, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And what he's saying is that we have no spiritual credit before God. Why are we blessed? Because we recognize that. We recognize that before God. We were like Paul says here in chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Dead, but God, rich in mercy, came in Christ and made us alive again. We haven't been left without a Redeemer. And friends, if you're looking at your life this morning, if you're looking at the state of the world, and you're thinking, gosh, what is going on? He hasn't left us without a Redeemer. And I think that's a word for somebody today. You need to hear that. You can be redeemed. You are redeemed when you're in Christ Jesus. Unless a grain of wheat dies, and that die, blessed are the poor in spirit, we realize we have no spiritual credit before God. We need to come to our Redeemer, because God hasn't left us without a Redeemer, praise the Lord. So that's the first thing. God hasn't left us without a Redeemer. The second thing the women say is, may His name be renowned in Israel. Boaz's name was indeed renowned in Israel. You saw it in the rest of the chapter. His name is part of the family tree of Judah, and eventually King David, and eventually Jesus. And what's a fascinating a little aside here that we kind of mentioned um, a couple of weeks ago when we talked about welcoming strangers was that Ruth, who is a Moabite, who is actually not supposed to be part of the people of Israel, in fact becomes now part of the, the Messiah's family tree. It's amazing. May his name be renowned in Israel. In the same way that Boaz's name has been made renowned in Israel, Jesus' name has been made renowned in all the earth. 
Jesus' name has been made renowned in all the earth. Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to, de- to the point of death, even death on a cross, which we'll think about in a couple of weeks, well, in not too long away. Now, therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus' name has been highly exalted so that He is renowned throughout the entire world. And so, therefore, what does that have to do with us. What does that have to do with unless a seed dies and falls in the ground can become fruitful? Our attitude should be like Jesus, that we don't consider anything of ourselves as something important. That is all the achievements. Later on in Philippians 3, Paul will talk about all his achievements, and he regards them as rubbish. means our attitude should be humble, and obedient in the same way that Jesus is. And as we do that, fruitfulness can increase in our lives because Jesus' name is exalted through us. And so, therefore, we can extend the name of Jesus. Friends, I don't want to hear the name of Jesus as a swear word anymore on the lips of children, no less. It's bad enough when adults do it, but when children do it, it's even worse. I don't want to hear his name being said as a swear word. I want to hear it being proclaimed from the rooftops that Jesus is Lord and he is exalted forever. That's what I want to hear. We can change that. We can make, an, we can make a difference in the world today if we just be humble and obedient like he was, die to ourself, ourself and learn to exalt Jesus, have His name on our lips in praise, not just because, not just in, uh, you you know, in just saying, uh, talking about Him, but actually in lifting His name before people. And that's part of how we can begin to be fruitful. Jesus' name is renowned in all the earth. And then the final thing that the women speak to Naomi about and bless her with is, He is a restorer to you in your old age. Uh, And He's going to restore life to you. Because, of course, the the, um, distinction being made here with Naomi in this whole chapter, this whole book, is that she was dead. She was bitter. She was, God had had His way with her and left her bereft. But, of course, what happens is she changes throughout the book, and we see her go from that bitterness into life, into full life. We see that Boaz is literally her restorer of life because Ruth can then have a child, and then that means that life has returned into her, and then she takes the baby and becomes a nurse. He is the restorer of life. And so, as Boaz is the restorer of life to Naomi and Ruth, so too Jesus is the restorer of life to you and me. Where we were dead in our sins and trespasses, we are now made alive with Christ, as we said in Ephesians chapter 2. He is the restorer of our life. If you feel like your life has already come to an end, Friend, I want to suggest to you that is not the case. If you still have, as we sung, breath in your lungs, that's not your breath, that's the breath of God in your lungs to declare the praises of Him who came to give us life in all its fullness. He is the restorer of life. The enemy 
Jesus said in John 10 verse 10, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life, and life in all its abundance, all its fullness. Do you today feel as though your life is like just pointless? Do you, I know the pandemic hasn't helped us in that. I know the pandemic has probably contributed to feelings of, of just what is the point of existing. But Jesus comes to restore life, comes to give us life. And so today, in His name, you can receive the fullness of that life. So that's the three things that we see that I wanted to pull out of, those, of that speech of the women at the end. God is, uh, and then relating to us, God is the one who redeems us. We've not been left without a Redeemer, and His name is renowned throughout the earth, and He is the restorer of life to us. Where we were dead, we are now alive. Amen. But the question still remains, going back to the, if a seed dies and, and all the rest of it, and we could be fruitful, how does that work for us? Well, I have one word for you, and it's a word that nobody likes to hear. It's a word that signifies giving up. It's a word that seems to think as though we've lost it, at least in the way the world thinks. And that one word is surrender. Surrender. And as I reflected on this passage and on the, the New Testament passage and what Jesus was, was asking, And that seemed to come so clearly to the fore. We need to surrender. And see, we don't like surrender because surrender means giving up my rights. But we live in a rights-based culture. We must stand up. We've got to stand up for your rights, everybody says. Don't let people walk all over you. Don't be a doormat. And there is an element of truth to that where we do need to be careful and not let people walk all over us. We do need to look after ourselves in that respect. And I don't think Jesus would be very honoring of somebody who lets people just walk all over them. So there is, there is an element of truth to that. But if you take it to its nth degree, what ends up happening is you don't ever you don't stand up for anybody's rights but your own. It becomes a completely selfish existence. And so when I say give up our rights, I'm, I'm pointing to the fact that actually in Jesus we have no rights. We have no earthly rights. Our rights are heavenly, and they're given to us by Christ. Which means, yes, we stand up for the rights of other people, but we don't constantly insist on my right to this, my right to the internet, my right to a car, my right to a roof over my head, my right to food in my belly, my right to get fat, or as the uh, uh, certain political lobbies, my, the right for a woman to choose what to do with her body, even if it does mean killing a life. And if you're wondering what I'm referring to there, abortion, which I very much disagree with. It's not about our rights. We don't like that word surrender. It also has the connotations of in a war situation or a conflict of raising the flag, the white flag and saying, we don't have anything left. Uh, you, 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 can, you can take it. Whatever this thing we're fighting about, you have it. We're, we're giving up. And we don't like that idea because our, our society is about winners, particularly if you're an American. It's all about being a winner. It's not about being, a, a, you know, a, a, you know the, oh, of course, in, in, in Britain, we, we love an underdog, so it's slightly different emphasis there. But it's all about winning. And everybody says, oh, it's not about the winning or losing. It's about taking part that matters. Rubbish. Everybody wants to win. Everybody wants to succeed. Everybody wants to have uh, that thing, that pinnacle of their existence to say, ah, yeah, look what I've done. But when we surrender, it means to the other side, we give up. We say, you take it. And we don't like that. But that's precisely what Jesus calls us to through the Lent series, through, the, through, through Lent, the season of Lent. It's about giving up. And not giving up as though, oh, I give up. It's about surrendering. And if you surrender, you surrender to something or someone. Now, you can either surrender to the world, the flesh, and the devil. And when you surrender to the world, flesh, and the devil, you don't have life. The world might, might, might like to think that you have life, but you don't. Instead, who we need to surrender to is God. 
We surrender to God because in surrendering to God, we die to the world, the flesh, and the devil in us, and we come alive to Christ and can experience that fruitfulness that he talks about in John 12. And he talks about it later on in John 15. We can be fruitful people when we surrender our all to God. It means He takes our rights on Himself. It means He says He takes all of us when we surrender as though raising the white flag. He takes it. And in so doing, gives us new life and makes us fruitful far beyond what we could ever ask or imagine or think as Paul prays for the church in Ephesians chapter 3. So if we're going to be fruitful, if we're going to be like that little seed that has the potential for a forest or an orchard, we need to be those who are surrendered to God. And as we'll see on Good Friday, as we commemorate Jesus' all that He did on Good Friday, we see that Jesus Himself did just that very thing. He surrendered His whole life to God. As we read in Philippians 2, even death on a cross. If Jesus is willing to give up His life for us, surely we ought to be in a position to give up our life for Him. Because as we do that, we find our true life, the true self, if you will, in Christ, way more than anything we could have ever thought about in our human limitation. We need to, we need to surrender. So let's spend a moment in quiet, allowing some of that to settle in our minds and say, God, what is that thing, that one thing you're telling me today that I need to do? What is that one thing you're speaking to me about? Where do I need to change if, if I need to change? What do I need to give up? What do I need to surrender today to God? Spend a moment in quiet and then we'll pray and then we'll sing a song uh, about surrendering. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come in our hearts and our minds today as we reflect on all that you've been saying. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I woke up this morning with one of my ears blocked, and uh, I've been trying to soften wax and things in it over the last week, and I thought, right, today I'm getting the syringe out, and I'm just clearing it out, and bless the Lord, <laughs> some stuff really did come out, which I was very grateful for, and then it was still blocked, and then I had to do some jiggery-pokery and, you know, you know, hold your nose and, and blow out and see what happens. And it spoke to me in that moment. I felt like the Lord was giving us a prophetic word for us as a people, as a church here. And I felt like God was saying to us, you know, our ears are blocked. Our ears are blocked. Our spiritual ears are blocked. And God wants to open them up. God wants to open them up. And I'm feeling like this pandemic has been an opportunity for us to experience the blockness but then also God wants us to now experience the unblockness. And I'll be honest with you, it's been hard for me over this pandemic, over these last few months, to really connect and commune with God in a way that I was used to. Excuse me. Because what's happened is I've allowed my heart to become hardened. And if that's the case for me, that may be the case for you as well. 
Maybe your heart has become hardened so that you can't hear, your spiritual ears are blocked. And I don't know if that's a word for anybody today, but if that's you, do, do let us know in the Zoom afterwards. Let us know if, that's, if you felt like that's something that God was speaking to you about. As you let your heart become hardened, because maybe some resentment's built up uh, through this pandemic for whatever reason. You know, for me, it's probably I'm, I'm annoyed at God because yeah, I've had to learn all how to do all this stuff differently, and I didn't like it. And it took me right out of my comfort zone. Yet, ironically, now it is the comfort zone. I don't want to go out of it and back to what we used to be because <laughs> I've got so used to this. Ironic, isn't it? Are your spiritual ears blocked? Do they need to be opened again? Do you need to, as it were, metaphorically, close your nose and blow out, and blow the junk out? Is there something in that, in your surrender, that needs to happen for that? Just bring it before the Lord now. Bring it before Him now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We bless your name. Thank you, God. So we're going to pray and give all this to the Lord. Father God, we thank you that uh, no matter what's happening in the world, you, use, you can use any circumstance to get your point across to us. And I pray, Father, if we are struggling with this idea of surrendering, that you would give us the ability to do that, to surrender, to say, Lord, you take it all. Take my life. Take my heart, take my mind, my body, and use it for your glory. And for those of us that maybe have spiritually blocked ears this morning, God says, I want to unblock your ears like I did with the syringe. Maybe we need to um, just do the, 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 the nose thing, the spiritual nose unblocking, whatever that means for us. So come, Holy Spirit, and blow through the caverns of our spiritual ears where they're blocked and take out all the junk that's accumulated there over the years that stops us from communing and being fruitful for you. Lord, whatever it is, as we surrender to you now, Lord, help us to hear you afresh in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing together that uh, famous old hymn of the church, All to Jesus I Surrender. And I don't want you to sing this unless you mean it. You've got to mean it. You've got to say, yes, Lord, I really, truly want to give it all up for you in this moment. But not just in this moment, ongoing, every day. It's almost got to be a daily thing, this surrender thing. You've got to do it all the time. Let's come to the Lord.